Good morning. Welcome to this uh, academic ceremony. Uh, my name is uh, Jos Lemming. I'm chairing uh, this morning this academic session. And in this academic session, um, Eric de la Fuente will try to defend his thesis, his dissertation. And the title of the dissertation is Limiting Media Freedom in Democratic States. Um, promoter, supervisor is Professor, uh, Professor uh, Tishon. Uh, I don't know if he is, yeah, of course. Um, welcome, Professor Tishon. Um, supervisor, uh, the second supervisor is uh, Dr. Van der Laar, and she is sitting here at the opposite uh, bench. Then uh, we have uh, as co-supervisor, Professor Gamara, and he's also present here. Thank you very much. There will be also some people of the opposition present um, here online, but we will start off with uh, the chair of the assessment committee after uh, Eric Lafuente is presenting, has presented um, the outline of his dissertation. And I will give you the floor 15 minutes to do that. Thank you. The upper rector, uh, dear members of the Corona, your family, friends, and audience, uh, thank you for being here today. And of course, a big thank you to my supervisory team, Dr. Vandelar, Dr. Lamarra, Dr. Sishon. It is your guidance through this journey that helped me be here today. Over the next 15 minutes, I will elaborate on my thesis research. This thesis analyzes a very relevant issue, both academically and for today's society. How governments use instruments to limit news media freedom in democratic states. It makes a contribution to the existing literature by providing empirical evidence from an understudy region that identifies the use of new instruments designed or adapted for the digital age, as well as traditional mechanisms that are still relevant. The extent to which those instruments are employed and how they're used to influence news media outlets and the work of journalists, all of this in the context of free liberal democracies. There's a strong consensus in the literature that authoritarian regimes or semi-democratic regimes interfere with news media outlets and aim to subdue press freedom. They tend to do it in overt ways for the more repressive torturing or imprisoning of journalists to closure of media outlets, to internet shutdowns, cyber attacks on news sites. But we know a lot less about what free democracies or liberal democracies do when they aim to limit media freedom. This is partly because the erosion of freedoms in democracies, including press freedoms, tends to occur gradually over time in a less visible, more subtle ways than in more restrictive societies. Literature also tells us that media freedom is an important pillar in contemporary democracies, with many scholars referring to that intrinsic relationship between democracy and media freedom. But by the 2010s, we started seeing reports from non-government organizations that monitor media freedom, stating that some democratic countries were experiencing a decline in press freedom. And this is what triggered my interest in the topic and ultimately triggered my research, exploring that puzzle, the coexistence of democratic states, democratic governments with limited media freedom. I chose to analyze the Freedom House data to establish an indicator because the organization had tracked both democracy and press freedom around the world for more than three decades. And when I reviewed the data, I saw that most scores correlated with free democracies having free media environments, those semi-democratic regimes having partly free media environments, and the authoritarian governments not having press freedom. But there was a subset of countries where that relationship was a little more complex. They were considered free democracies with free and fair elections, political opposition, political parties, where the media openly criticized the government, but yet their media freedom score has slid into partly free. When reviewing the data, I also saw that the majority of those countries, of those democracies in that specific subset of group were young democracies, which the literature identifies into primarily two groups, as Converse and Kapanen will say, those to transition after 1960, and later with a third wave of democratization, a coined term by Samuel Huntington, 
uh, the democracies that transition in the 1970s and 80s, then early 1990s. This was a global wave, but Latin America and Central and Eastern Europe were at the forefront. So after a thorough analysis, I reached my main research question. How do governments influence news media freedom in young democracies in the digital era? And I focus on young democracies because 85% of the countries uh, in that subset group fell in that category. And I placed the question in the digital era because as I was reviewing my data way when I started um, uh, the, the research, the trend was already showing that media was transitioning to the digital sphere. Traditional media, TV, radio, and print had either established online platforms or were in the midst of it, and there was a growing number of nascent digital-only news media outlets appear. That trend has obviously continued. My sub-questions were, what are the main categories of instruments used to curb media freedom? And within those categories, what were the instruments each in, in, in each category? And how do governments employ those instruments in their interactions with the media? I chose to do a case study comparison between two young democracies in Latin America, Argentina and Chile. We share similar characteristics, history, language, the geographical neighbors, their internet penetration levels, especially placing this in the digital era, were among the highest in the region, continue to be today. Their GDP per capita at the time of the research was very similar. And very importantly, both countries had transitioned to democracy from military regimes that had stifled the media roughly about the same time in the 1980s. They had similar characteristics, but diverged substantially with regards to levels on news media freedom over the period study. Both of these countries started roughly about the same level at the beginning of the study period, which was 2000, which is really the time that internet started blossoming in Latin America. But their scores deviated by the end of the study period quite extensively, showing a 21 point gap, which is a vast difference in the index by 2015, which was the end of the study period. That data was an important indicator, but I corroborated the information by reviewing uh, reports, detailed reports from organizations that cover press freedom issues, like the Organization of American States and the Special Rapporteur uh, for Freedom of Expression, the Inter-American Press Association and other NGOs. And consistently, the reports showed Argentina, the free democracy with eroding press freedom, very much worse than Chile, with more detailed accounts of press freedom violations. How did we collect the data and what methodology did I use? This study uses a mixed method analysis as it combines various quantitative and qualitative techniques into a four dimensional methodological approach to detect infringements on press freedom. One, I review policy documents and reports from international organizations that monitor press freedom. Two, I design, executed, and analyzed a digital news media survey. And I did that to identify the category of instruments. And to do that, I thought that the best way was to go to the front line and to ask the journalists themselves. About they're the, the ones that experienced those subtle pressures firsthand. The third component was an assessment of the media, uh, media related legal and regulatory framework in both countries. And I did that because while the survey uh, identified the main category of instruments, it also clearly stated that the laws were not one of those key instruments. So I wanted to go back into the data and look. So I analyzed the media related laws, international treaties ratified by the countries that were given national legal status and a lot of times constitutional hierarchy and court rulings. The results showed that indeed, the legal instruments were not the key tools employed. But to further investigate the main categories of the instruments identified in the survey, I took the fourth step and I conducted in-depth interviews with key informants, subject matter experts from various sectors. Of course, journalists, media owners, government officials from different parties, NGO representatives, business executives, and academics to get different perspectives, points of consensus regarding this topic. The empirical findings of this research show that some young democracies do employ subtle instruments that encroach on press freedoms with a preferred instruments falling into two categories, economic pressure tools and non-physical harassment. The economic pressure mechanisms fall into two subcategories, the use of state advertising to influence editorial content 
uh, many times the government is the leading advertiser in the country, advertising being the number one revenue for most media. And the economic pressure on private sector companies to withdraw advertisement from news media critical of the government, with the government conditioning contracts of companies that didn't comply or tax investigations, because the private sector advertising market remained very important as well. The other side, the non-physical harassment of journalists to influence editorial content entail various instruments from traditional ones, so defaming them in a speech or through public uh, uh, pro-government uh, media or telephone calls to, in to investigate. But what we also found that even back when I started doing the research, the government was employing online trolls to harass journalists. And at that time, was primarily in the comment section, systematically in their blogs. And that was something in a free liberal democracy that what we were finding. The empirical findings of this research lead to a central conclusion. Even in free democracy, even free democracies, especially young ones, can and do use subtle tools to curb media freedom. The preferred instruments are from the categories of economic pressure and non-physical harassment, including traditional methods that are still relevant and newer ones developed or adapted to the digital era. All mechanisms, however, have one thing in common. They are subtle and hard for the general population to perceive and typically can be implemented under the public radar. When used together, these mechanisms have been found to effectively exert pressure on news media, especially at a time when the digital transformation has brought financial havoc and lots of economic pain to the media industry. This has made news outlets more susceptible to government pressure instruments. Ultimately, these actions can amount to indirect censorship, which weakens press freedom. These sort of instruments of media control can be an early sign of declining levels of media freedom in free democracies, if not countered at the infant stages. These mechanisms can continue to erode press freedom slowly, but eroding it, making it difficult to revert that trend later, and thus ultimately weakening democracy itself. Considering reports about formerly free democracies, which experienced sufficient democratic backsliding in recent years to fall into the party free category, reveals a wider theory. Governments that move from liberal to illiberal democracies are likely to curb media freedom to help them remain in power. They will likely have employed subtle methods to limit press freedom and continue to do so until they reach the point where the restraints on democracies and attacks on media freedom cannot be overlooked, crossing a visibility threshold. And at this point, political leaders may be able to act and even publicly announce, as some have done, that their government is now an illiberal democracy. They will be able to do so because they will have gained enough control over media outlets to not fear a media outcry or a media trigger public opposition to their actions. And by the time they cross a visibility threshold, they might begin to employ over instruments against news outlets as they embrace the aspects of illiberal democracy. But until crossing the visibility threshold, however, these governments are very likely to use these subtle instruments found in this research to avoid threats in the pursuit of power. And in these reports, there are countries from all over the world, but we don't have to go far from here to see a good example, just a little bit farther east, in the case of Hungary, where Viktor Orban and his party have just been elected for the fourth consecutive term, but there are serious reports about news media freedom erosion in a country that not long ago was considered a free democracy with a free, uh, with a free press. It is important to test that theory in these and other cases and other studies to examine whether free democracies are backsliding into media freedom, systematically use these instruments identified in the study at the early stages, were they using these instruments when it started, when it started to erode, and to what extent did they use it, and how did they implement those instruments? That is part of the future academic research that we can go back into other areas of the globe. And also, of course, uh, if we're sitting now in 2022, the importance of including social media and looking as, as there's good reason to believe that these mechanisms are not being directed on social media platforms as well. I would just, just wanted to also share three uh, policy recommendations I, I thought about throughout my, my work. International watchdog organizations should make identifying 
and counteracting the erosion of news media freedom in the early stages of priority. I understand what it takes a long time into the very funds to places that appear more grave, but if you can attack it early, it might be a good sign. Development agencies should support financial should, should provide financial support to digital only news media outlets in democracies. Financial independence usually means editorial independence. And governments, parliaments, and international bodies should support legislation requiring internet platforms such as Google or Facebook to compensate news media outlets for the content. Content they monetize, but a lot of times those are created never receive a penny. And I will conclude by re-emphasizing that the state of media freedom in any society needs to be closely and constantly monitored by the society itself. Media freedom can be a risk even in free democracies and with it, a nation's overall democratic freedom. Thank you for your attention and I now give back the word to the Perret. Thank you for this, uh, this introduction and presentation. Uh, I would like to open uh, the discussion um, with the opposition. And first, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Koser, Professorial Fellow at UNU Merit and Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Funds Fund at GCRF. Professor Koser, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean. I hope you can see me and hear me okay. And thank you for managing my long-winded organization in your, in your introduction there. Eric, I'm terribly sorry I can't be with you. I had planned to be there until very recently and couldn't come for personal reasons, but looking forward to meeting you in the not too distant future. Um, I acknowledge that I'm not an expert in this field. And so I found this a really interesting opportunity to, to read about the puzzle you've identified and to read a really well-written, well-put-together thesis that I think goes a long way towards answering that puzzle. So congratulations. It was um, a real honor to chair the assessment committee. And I have to say, I've chaired quite a few assessment committees at Maastricht before, and I don't think I've ever seen such a collection of positive feedback from uh, the opposition. So. This is obviously a very, very strong thesis with, with very strong support from your opposition. Um, if I may say so, you're also an excellent communicator. That was a very good, convincing presentation. I, I mean, I just wanted to push you a little bit, if I could, on the academic theoretical relevance of this piece of work. Um, I mean, I think it is appropriate, given the topic, that this is mainly a policy piece of work. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, you said at the beginning, Part of your academic contribution was providing original empirical data from an understudied region. I think that that's true. Uh, you sort of you laid out towards the end there a sort of an approximate correlation. As free democracies become illiberal, then you can expect media freedoms to be restricted. I think that makes sense. But I'd love you to say a bit more about how, sort of from a theoretical academic perspective, you think your thesis is 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 adding value and and, and adding to knowledge. Please. Yeah. Thank you, highly esteemed opponent, for your question. Yes, uh, there are a, a number of, of, of studies that, that look at democracies uh, and the way they have been eroding in press freedom. But I think that this study brings uh, uh, first a methodological approach to get how we get into the into the details, especially when you're looking into a terms of uh, like of press freedom, where a lot of the information has to be corroborated and a lot of times done off the record. And then when it comes to the type of regimes, uh, look, free democracies uh, to implement instruments in, in, in such subtle ways that I think the most important thing here is to test this theory in other um, in other case studies in other countries, but at the very early stage and in free and liberal democracies. The issue of news media freedom tends to come to the radar, even in the academic uh, uh, research that I had a little bit later on. There's, of course, uh, studies that uh, now have uh, are indulging in this area. And for example, I'll give you I'll give you an example on this. There's a lot of work done on the state advertising, a lot of work in different parts of the world. And then we see my, my research falls into that, bringing empirical evidence. But it's usually focused on state advertising, that level of instruments done to exert pressure on the private sector, which remains the larger part of advertising, even in the case of Argentina, where the government was the leading advertiser in the country, the total of government advertising was 9%. So yes, it's important. Yes, individually it's important. But what I've found out is what was being done, again, in the early stages, 
in the early stages, Your Honor, the level of pressure on the private sector to withdraw advertising, to withdraw financial support, to support um, uh, media that was government friendly or at least not uh, con uh, to, to help them stop some sort of investigative important. That was something uh, that, that, that I think that, it, that we can test in other parts and look at the early stages when a country is still a free democracy. The other thing is, we, uh, I, I think we can test whether free democracies, liberal democracies are paying online trolls. Again, this is something the literature clearly tells us that occurs in authoritarian regimes. And in fact, in semi-democratic regimes, right? And much more now than when I even started. But my research shows that this happens in liberal democracies. And it's very hard to trace back the financing of online trolls. Nobody puts them in their payroll. There is no link back. And there are plenty of trolls out there that are not paid by anybody. So the link to find that a lot of the instruments that go to the digital era, again, in the infant stages, when it's starting, what is still part, uh, possible to revert, I think is important. I think academically can be looked in other parts of the world and countries with these similar characteristics. Thank you. Then the opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Weyermans. Um, she is um, assistant professor in cybersecurity and politics at political science and at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be serving on this committee, I have to say. Um, since I think this is, uh, I have to congratulate the candidate on a very important study, drawing attention indeed to an understudied region. So if you look at research conducted on journalism, especially also on digital journalism at the moment, there is a very strong geographical focus within that body. Uh, so I very much welcome the contribution that this, uh, this thesis makes. Uh, what I also welcome is how you draw attention that there is a differentiation between covert and overt strategies of influencing, uh, which for me really resonates what I also see in my own research on Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so in that sense, I, uh, I think this is really important work. What I want to ask you about is indeed, what is the difference then and what are the boundaries there? So if we speak about overt strategies, uh, law comes to mind, these are very uh, clear examples. And covert strategy, she very rightfully draw attention to advertisement budgets and as well uh, also online advertisement budgets. Um, and you speak about a visibility threshold for the public. So which kinds of strategies are they able to detect and which types are they not able to detect? So what I want to ask you about is for the public, where is that visibility threshold? Uh, since it might be different for those inside the business those who know how it works and those on the outside, while well, you would rely on the outside for making indeed uh, alarm that something is going on. So where is the visibility threshold when you speak about the outside? That's the first part of the question. Uh, and the second is if you could reflect on, has this changed for the digital environment that we have now? Uh, so both what counts as covert and overt, as well as this, uh, this visibility threshold. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Opponent, for your question. There are several parts here. Uh, the covert and overt um, um, strategies. Uh, I'll just start by saying that I, that I the, the main part of the research was to focus on the instruments that they use, right? That was what I focused on and tried to, um, the, the, the very specific narrow part of the research. But since you invite me to this topic, go further, I, I, will, I will take that invitation. As I conducted my in-depth interviews, what became clear is that for, uh, especially because looking at different actors of society, I, what I was looking, what were the points of consensus that people were saying, whether not just a journalist that was doing it, but here is an academic or a business who had clients or consumers, et cetera, is that a number of the, uh, the, the covert uh, uh, strategies and, and covert I do mean for the general population, not for those that are in this conversation that we're looking, is that, for example, the issue, especially the issue of the private sector advertising became one of the most important. Why? Because a company has no regulations whether they should put their advertisement or not. You can reduce 
your advertising because you have budget reasons. You can you reduce your advertisements because X amount of reasons internally. And there is not, uh, like, with, like with public sector money, there is not clear guidance where that has to be. So for the public to be able to see, especially in private sector media, uh, that was one that is not easy to detect. And also, because what I found in the research was that some media outlets were clearly become pro-government, but some, no, it's just the tone was often, uh, it didn't mean that you didn't, didn't even receive a criticism in that outlet, but maybe instead of receiving criticism, often you got one criticism in 10 pro articles. It was very tough, and plus the general public was not following that. So that was very uh, important. The other one, uh, I look at strategies again. These are co co um, covert, I would say, subtle, you know, subtle strategy, but the visibility threshold is hard. Uh, if you look at, let's, we just take an article online and you go to the comment section. Most of the comments are usually very negative, they're attacking, yeah. But, and some of those literally could be just somebody that chose to wrote that, write that. But what we found out, and the reason we saw it was systematic, is because journalists will tell me, uh, and again, corroborated by NGOs and academics that were looking because I thought, well, let me make sure the journalist is not biased or just because I had a bad experience, is that if they wrote a certain article, there will be a comment and then very similar comments or comments that have done like a week ago. So it was now done into algorithms much later on and, and so on. I think you said about over it, and this is why uh, the, the issue of the laws, I think, come into place. Because in a democracy, you cannot just change a law or apply a law without being covered. So it's not that covert. And this is what a lot of journalists said, even in countries where the propositions or le or, 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 or legislation was being, it was being discussed. I think most of the, uh, of the cases that, that I saw, again, had to do with money and even in state advertising. while. There is, uh, it, there is not very clear in many, in many, in the case study that I, that I, that I researched, uh, what is the guidance for putting state advertising? That it's not very clear. There's not, not clear guidance of whether the government needs to invest or not. It, 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 it also differs where it's at the national stage or by certain provinces. And again, it's not something that, um, that the general population follows. And I think as we moved into the digital era, it actually becomes more difficult, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's just, I'm just taking your invitation. What I saw in my case studies is that when you look, for example, in the digital part, it is it, the, the advertisements say that is the same issue, but the online, the, the issue of online trolls in a free democracy, which I was really quite um, um, surprised uh, in the liberal democracy was very hard to detect. And, and while we have much more transparency, it's also, there is a lot more clutter for the general public that is not every day looking at this to see that until infringements become much more later on. Thank you very much. The uh, opposition will be continued by Dr. Alvarado. Um, he is director of the Spanish language journalism master program in the US. Uh, and he is with us online Dr. Alvarado, the floor is yours. Please, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm very happy to be here, although it's virtually. I want to be with there, Eric, but uh, COVID, COVID hit me really hard uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I had to cancel all plans of traveling. Um, I'm still suffering the effects of this malicious virus, but uh, I'm very happy to be here, although it's a little early here. Um, it, the, the effort, uh, it's, it's good. I, I, I really um, enjoy the work that you have done. I congratulate you for this dissertation, that it's timely and uh, that it's methodologically uh, rigorous and very well structured and uh, also very well written. Uh, you have studied one of uh, the main issues in the world. Freedom of expression is not only threatened by governments, but in some cases by criminal organizations, mainly drug traffickers, together with corrupt politicians. So uh, thank you for this studying. I think it's really relevant. Um, 
particularly now that here in the United States, we're in the process of reviewing uh, the actions of a former president and what it's called now the big lie. And uh, I would like to take you out from your comfort zone and uh, have a question <laughs> that it's not necessarily connected to Argentina and Chile. Um, there is no doubt that democracy and freedom of press are an expression are intrinsically united. There is no democracy without freedom of press, period. But dictators and populists who consider themselves Democrats don't believe that. I would like you to reflect, why do you think is that? They say that they govern for the working class and for those in the formal economy or without a job. Do you, do you think that those social groups, which are the vast majority, don't believe in democracy and freedom of press as well? And that dictators and populists are just following the feeling of the people? Thank you, Alistair opponent, for your question. Um, of course, in my research, I focus on the case studies of Argentina and Chile, and those are the ones that I researched and did uh, exhaustive uh, academic work on. But again, I'll take on this invitation to uh, give you my thoughts on this process. Uh, I think uh, what we're seeing today, first of all, validates a lot of the work done. Uh, I remember that it was questioned back in 2015 uh, whether this would be a real big issue in more mature democracies as well, even in younger democracies. And I think I don't need to tell anybody in this room that these questions have been answered. Free democracies, the freedom of the press is not guaranteed under any democracy, and especially because a lot of these sort of instruments. I will speak on my opinion whether, I, th I think that issue of populism that you mentioned is an interesting one because it implies that it's popular, right? And it doesn't have an ideology. And in Latin America for a long time, we saw attacks on freedom of the press or was perceived as primarily left-wing populists, right? They will come in and they really um, um, repress press freedom. What we've seen in Latin America, and now we see it in other parts of the world, that it had no ideology. There's a lot of right-wing populism that also employ a lot of similar tools to repress the, the freedom. But one of the things I saw, and I did see in the literature, is that part of the attack on the harassment side was not just to intimidate journalists, but also to attack the credibility of not just the individual journalists, but of the media industry itself. Long before fake news became a normal word in our, in our lingo, this was already being used in a lot of our countries. And when you attack the credibility of the medium, and I must say, there's always good journalists and not so good journalists, that happens in every, in every profession, I think starts eroding the, the trust. And I say that to sort of allude to whether people believe or not believe in freedom of the press or not. What Paul, what studies, uh, uh, surveys that, uh, that I've seen from very respected, especially in, in, in Latin America, is that the level of trust in the media, of course, has gone way down. It's one of the institutions less trusted. And now we're seeing that in the United States and, and, and in other parts of the world. And what I would say is that when public opinion is, when a message is reiterated over and over again by political leaders from different aspects. You, you see it in news outlets themselves criticizing other news outlets, not on the political stance they have, but on the credibility of the media itself. It starts to erode that trust. And eroding that trust might lead to believe that people believe in it less in these in populist leaders or leaders that try to erode uh, press freedom and democracies, take advantage of that and in terms of, of moving their agenda. But I would say my research, again, focused on Argentina and Chile, 
and focused on young democracies. And that's what I research on primarily, but I think this is a relevant issue in the overall conversation. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Eric. Then the opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Marotta. Um, she is assistant professor and director of the Master in Public Policy and Human Development Program in Maastricht, you uh, and you merit. And um, the chair, to be complete, and the chair of the assessment committee was Professor Koser, uh, a member of the assessment committee, um, Dr. Weijemars and Dr. Uh, Alvarado. And um, Dr. Marotta is also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you, Chairman. Dear candidate, dear Eric, congratulations for completing your research. I enjoyed reading your book and want to praise the comprehensive approach you took to answer your research question because you used different methods. And also I want to praise, praise the sample size of your survey and your interviews. I read like 50, 70. So it's, it's, it's really impressive what you have done. And that we all know that it's a lot of work, but also it means that you gather very relevant empirical evidence. So congratulations for that. I would like to, ask, to focus my first question on the design of the survey. I know you are expecting a different question, most probably. <laughs> um, you start with a main research question, which was neutral. Uh, you ask how to governments influence news media freedom in young democracies in the digital area. And in chapter four, you mentioned that the survey aims at identifying the control instruments employed by governments to influence media freedom. Up to here, the study seems to be neutral for allowing for negative and positive ways of influencing. However, in your survey, you drafted the questions mostly in the negative. I give you examples. On question three, you asked, on scale from one to seven, do laws and or regulations place restrictions on digital media? On question four, you asked, in your opinion, do you agree with the statement internet and or telecommunications laws in your country place restrictions? on journalist bloggers. So to me, not surprisingly, most of the results also present primarily the restrictions. So I would like to ask how you perceive my observations, the rationale for the questions you have included in the survey, and if, if you think that indeed you gave space to discover the positive influences with the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Bonner, for your question. Uh, first, I designed the survey, uh, breaking it down into four categories. I specifically did one on legal. I did one on um, economic issues, on harassment. And the fourth one, which was not about categories, but it was that influence any of those who have in the editorial stance that the journalists might have. The other thing I did that I think is important in terms of designing the survey as well was the selection of the journalist. Um, and in countries like Argentina and Chile, uh, it's, it's very Im important and, and to not just restrict yourself to the capital, which has the majority of the media outlets and the bigger ones. Uh, it's easier to do, but it's more interested in also to travel the country, but uh, going to, to the different provinces uh, and, and interviewing editors and journalists as well. The other thing was to get what I call the tier one media, which is the national media, the media that has the, most, the, the majority of the influence and the majority of circulation, and tier two, which are important, but maybe for a specific region or uh, area of study. And it was also representations of females and, and, and males uh, in, in, both, in both countries as well. And there was a mix of journalists who worked for traditional media, but worked on the digital platform of the traditional media, and others that just worked on digital only media. I think the questions gave, uh, gave enough room in the sense that most of the questions had a spectrum of what they can choose. They could, they could look at that question and, and pick from least pressure to most pressure. And most of the questions had that. And in some of the questions even had that, if that happened, what would be less? What would be, what would be then the, uh, uh, the extra details? The other thing that tells me that, um, that, um, that the survey worked on is that the same survey was given to both countries. And yet the results were drastically different. Thus, 
Um, while there's always improvement for every survey, no doubt, uh, I think the survey gave enough leeway to the journalists both to, uh, to show whether they felt there was more pressure or not on a different part, whether they thought there was pressure in one area or not in another, that's why we broke it down. And I used a part of the influence on editorial content and it was something that I was almost scared when I was looking at the results to see, please, so let's see what's going on here. Because if somebody would have said, yes, there is a lot of pressure, but no, my editorial stance is not influenced, then we probably would have had some sort of problem. But I mean, th th we had to correlate that. But again, countries answer differently to the same questions and, 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 and the same. And it really, if, if you look at the, at the results, uh, we could also see that tier one was different than tier twos, uh, like the na national and, and, the, and the local. And, uh, and, but even for example, in the free democracy, there was not that much difference between the, what I call tier two, or the smaller uh, publications in regions in Argentina and in Chile, but yet at the national level, the ones that have much more public uh, uh, following and, and public opinion, you saw a lot of that difference. So in trying to respond to your questions, uh, I thought there was enough room for journalists to express. There was enough diversity of journalists, both themselves and for the outlets they work for. And, um, and I think uh, the, the, the reflection on their oppression or editorial stance helped corroborate if they were um, uh, interpreting it well. The last thing I, I forgot is that I tested this survey before going to the countries. I picked, I picked journalists in, in, in places where, I, where, where they would have been part of the study, that would have been the study. And part of my question was the length, the, the time it took, et cetera. But also, they, you know, I, I've, I've interviewed them. Did they feel slanted about it, et cetera? And the feedback was generally positive. Thank you. Can, can I follow up with, yeah, may, may I follow up? Oh. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, th thanks for the answer. Could, because this, this is something that is in my mind. Could, could you elaborate um, what, from the, from the results, what type of positive instruments you have seen that the government has implemented in order to enhance freedom of press? Well, I think I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on one, and that I, that I think actually it's, a, it's a, a one that we're seeing, and the trend is saying, and in fact, Latin America's it's at, at the forefront in some of these things. Chile was in Argentina, actually, Guaran, which is uh, the right to access to information. There's been a lot of campaigns. Uh, we, we, wait, let me step back. We think of freedom of the press just when we, you know, you're curtail, you're not allowed to say something or to write something. But public information is public. It should be access for everybody, right? Yep. And, and, and there, what, there is still a lack of mechanisms and actually, awareness that these mechanisms exist, and not just for the journalist, for the average citizen, to be able to go to a ministry, go to any government, a state entity, and be able to request that information, and to have a, a, a sort of a mechanism where you need to respond in a certain time with a certain information. There's a lot of work to be done in that area, and it's in, very important for freedom of expression. I think in that area, I think Chile was one of the uh, was at the vanguard of this, and and in the case of Argentina, even though there was a decree early on back in the mid 2000s, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, that the the law of access to information didn't come until much much later towards the end of my study, but uh, it was an interesting step because a person that was put in charge was a former special rapporteur for freedom of expression, uh, which was one of my interviewees. So I think. There is now not only mechanisms being put in place, but the idea there, I, I sense that awareness that uh, or, 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 or raising awareness among the public that this is your right. And I think if I have to think of one at, at this moment, and again, uh, I will have to do bigger academic research on how that, that happened, it wasn't, but, it, but, I, but if, I, if I want to uh, in that on your question, uh, this is one of them. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Leerkes, um, professor at uh, Maastricht Graduate School of Governance uh, and Erasmus University. The floor is yours. Thank you, dear candidate. Um, I read your thesis with 
great interest. I think, uh, well, others have already said it. It, it, it deals with a very important uh, topic. The freedom of the press, I think, is under pressure, not just in young democracy. So it's important that we learn more about uh, the conditions under which it is possible and the mechanism through which this happens. It's also, I think, a very well composed and well written uh, thesis, uh, making me wonder whether you're a journalist yourself, perhaps. Um, don't know that, but uh, and it's also quite an achievement that, uh, that you have such a high response also among journalists, for example, and did the expert interviews. So, but my more critical questions are about your uh, methodology in relation to your research question. Because um, both offered research question, and I also think you have a covered, a covered research question, a little bit like the, the topic that you studied. I think your covered research question is um, what explains the difference in the, the, the activities by states to limit the freedom of the press between Argentina and Chile. Uh, in a way, so the comparative aspects. And I don't think you really answered that forward question. No? So, but also your over question, okay, so how do states do it? You say it's a, uh, an, an inductive study, but I think your approach is actually mostly uh, deductive because you take from the literature, uh, what we already know a little bit about the mechanisms. Uh, so I think from the economic pressure and harassment is already in your literature review. And then you illustrate that for uh, for the cases, and you uh, you do uh, elaborate it a bit also with the based on the expert interviews. Uh, you, you, you identify subtypes within these categories, but that's I think a, a, also an achievement. But it does raise the question: uh, Could there be other mechanisms? Could there be other mechanisms uh, that you could have discovered also through this through this case study or through case? Uh, uh, so. So, so that's the question. Could there be other mechanisms, and and how would you how would you find that out? And related to your covered Richard question, what are your thoughts about the explanation or the the causes of the differences between Chile and Argentina? Uh, if it's not the uh, legal framework, what then explains this difference, and how could you find it out? And maybe it's related a little bit to what you've been saying about freedom of information, but yeah. Thank you, highly esteemed opponent, for your question. Uh, when I was uh, trying to in dive myself in there, uh, one of the thoughts that came out is there could be a lot of things, right, taking place, and then you, you know, not every country is the same, even if you're similar. What I did in my research is try to focus on what were the key ones, what were the main ones that again, trying to follow the identification from the journalists. What were the main ones that were studied? Were there others that maybe one person mentioned or two people mentioned, sure. Uh, the, what I did to sort of also strengthen that is not just take the survey findings, uh, but in the, the survey also helped me elaborate the questionnaire for the in-depth interviews. And I expanded the group of the interviews to not just be journalists or media owners or even just government, because I wanted to have really the best or the best possible uh, variety uh, um, on society asking business executives. Many had never been asked questions on this topic. Uh, bringing academics from different parts, bringing NGOs as well. And I maybe was uh, fortunate enough to get good interviews through good contacts of people that were inside the government, people that have been outside the government, very off the record, people that designed some of the instruments, uh, um, and looking to see what was the thought process of the ones that were there. Could there be other mechanisms? Probably other, there are other mechanisms. There, there, uh, but what led to my research and my findings is that which were the main mechanisms, which were the mechanisms that there was consensus on that was highly identified by the journalists, definitely with the media owners, and there was highly consensus with different parts of the, uh, of the uh, informants that were, that were interviewed. And I think that led to a much more convincing uh, empirical findings. I even went back uh, and we made a decision to do a chapter on the legal and regulatory framework, even though it was not one of the main instruments, because I needed to corroborate that I was not sure. So we needed to go back and look and ask, I mean, were these treaties? I mean, there were media laws, including in Argentina, 
at the time that was really highly profile uh, at the time, but was that the ones that made the, or, or that impacted the work of the journalists and we saw that was not, and then we were able to dive into the ones that were main ones. And not every instrument that was identified in the survey made it to the final empirical findings. There were some that, that did not, because in the interviews, there was not convincing evidence for me to be able to write that. I want to touch on that other point that, uh, that, uh, that you mentioned, which is, you know, what were the causes, right? And while, again, I'll go back to say that the research focused on what were the instruments, to what extent, how they were implemented. I did, and I mentioned uh, briefly in the book, uh, when you see the difference between countries, and I, and I do answer the difference in terms, by the way, let me just go back a second, that there was a vast difference on the way that instruments were used or not, short, leading to different levels of media freedom. But when I look at the causes, for example, I, I, I reached some, 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 some thoughts on this. One is uh, the difference on staying power in the government. In the case of Argentina, during the period that I studied, the same government was always there, freely elected. It was a husband and wife, uh, um, and, and that one highly popular uh, at the beginning. And uh, they, no, no, none of the elections were stolen. Uh, they were internationally observed. Um, and they stayed throughout the, the, the entire time. Uh, and I think when you have, when, when you, uh, when a government doesn't fear that an opposition might win, you can start to implement these instruments because they might not be used against you. In the case of Chile, uh, during the time that, that, I, that I researched, not only there was a change in government, but it was sort of like a, uh, uh, they, they had to negotiate power. Most of the time, the governments were coalitions. They were socialist governments and center-right governments. And even those governments, had to do had to be in coalitions and they alternated, but I think the strength of the institutions and again that has to be much more academically uh, looked at. I mean I, the, the the idea of, of the of the strength of the of the, of the institutions also matter. And for example, certain certain guidance on what you can and cannot spend on on, on advertising, for example, or what type of or, or or in the case of access to information, uh, in the case of Chile, if a public servant does not respond to a request, not only is he or she reprimanded, but they might have even some other administrative penalty because they need to fulfill their duties, right? In the type of, of sense. But I think uh, the, the, the importance um, of continuity in power, and you see that a lot of the, the, the uh, at least in reports, I mean, we put Hungary here, there is no doubt about it that we, can, we have the same government in power and since he wrote it. And we, that's what we need to test this theory, what was happening early on in these places, right? I think that was one of the, the, the key issues at hand, as well as the strengthening of the institutions and that we saw the difference between one and the other. Just briefly, I think it's very interesting uh, thoughts that you have. I would recommend to uh, pursue them. Thank you. So there is still a bit of time for a, uh, a start of a second round. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Koser uh, if there's uh, a question from your hand in the second round. Thank you, Dean, and well done. Well done, Eric, you're nearly at the end. Um, I just wanted to go back to this question of a future research agenda that you began to, to speak about. You you made the case that we should be testing your theory, your framework in other countries early on in the, in the transition from democracy. You admitted that social media is a gap because, because of the dates of the work that you did. But if you went back to Chile and Argentina to do a postdoc on the same topic, what, what would you do next? What are the gaps in those countries? Well, I think in, in, in those countries, what I would do is these are countries that are democracy. So there's uh, uh, so there are new governments elected. The first thing I would do is really monitor what policies early on, early on. I cannot emphasize enough that in the including in the media freedom world with NGOs and experts, most of the attention most of the resources 
are provided to places where there is grave situations. And I understand that. I was born in the dictatorship. I understand why. Yeah, there's no doubt, by the way, this is on free democratic states, but there is no doubt that it's a really bad situation in authoritarian regimes, dictatorship. We already know that, right? So I understand that. And in semi-democratic regimes, once they cross a visibility threshold, it's hard to bring Hungary back, right, right now. But what I would do is that if you tackle this early on, if you address this early on, if you raise awareness early on in the society, I think we would most likely or possibly, there's no magic pill to this issue, most likely will not be dealing with some of the issues we're dealing in the liberal democracies before they really slide uh, on that. And I think the other thing, I, I, I want to go back to a topic that I think I would do in these countries, but I think it's applicable to other countries. The arrival of the internet has was f accompanied by a narrative that information was free. It was great, right? But journalists, to do good investigative journalism, you need money. You need to pay salaries. And if you look in Argentina and in Chile, I'll give you those countries because I looked at them. But I, I, I venture to say that this is a trend globally. The number of people that are willing to pay a subscription to read good content is in the single digits. Now we will have to see in other countries. Now we want quality journalism. We want independent journalism. We want in journalism that balances different points of views. But that takes time, that takes money. And so I would, what, one of the things that I would do, especially, and again, I would do it globally, but especially in liberal democracies where you can work with legislation, where you can uh, work with civil society, is to set the trend, for example, for uh, um, uh, the way um, new outlets can be better financed. And, and, and I, there's a school of thought that says, well, we need more government intervention in financing. And if all things were square, you would say, okay, there is guidance and probably, but at least in Latin America has shown that there's usually a political purpose behind it. So what I, most of, what I would say, and this is why one of my recommendations focuses on the internet platforms, the large social media. Most of the advertising that the media has lost has gone to social media platforms. Now these social media platforms, and I am not, I think they serve a great role in society, but right now they're also are part of a problem. This is not a zero sum game. They can be part of the solution, but they monetize a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, um, content that is written by somebody somewhere. And time and time again, you know, when I talk to editors in different parts of the world, they come back to this, it's the biggest problem is you can't have journals. Now we are moving to online, to digital only. It's, it takes less money to run a, 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 a news outlet when it's online, but the experience of running a business model, the financial havoc in there on the business model, it, it's very hard. So that makes them more susceptible to government. So I would look especially, and you can start in the free democracies where you can really have this debate. You can move that narrative to also bring to liberal democracies and other places. Thank you. Do you have some final uh, conclusions or final remark? I will just give a final remark. Media freedom is something that is important to me as a person. That's why I study it to any society because it's not just something abstract. If we let media freedom erode, we are eroding all of our rights. So to me, it is an important issue for to look not just in the case studies I research but all over because it's important for democracy. It's important for all of our lives as well. Thank you for your time. Okay, then uh, time appointed for defending your thesis uh, has passed now. Um, the degree committee will now withdraw and to discuss the quality of your thesis and the book and uh, the oral defense uh, that we just had.
I request that you and your company will await the results of our deliberations and return um, and, and, and our return to this uh, room.
shut down the computer. I'm so glad your thing is over. Eric de Lafment, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Sichon and uh, Dr. van der Laar uh, are authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. Uh, I invite your supervisor, in this case, uh, uh, Dr. Van, Laar, van der Laar is present here uh, to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the decision vested by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Eric de la Fuente, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, by the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. The laudatio will be um, will be done by Professor uh, Kishon online. No, no. Uh, it will be yeah. done by oh, Professor sorry. Uh, sorry for that, for the confusion. Um, so yeah, you you will do that. Yeah, uh, Professor Gamara. Okay. I'm um, I'm privileged to uh, to be here today, Eric, um, and. What I'm uh, going to do actually is to speak on, on behalf of, of the three of us who have been part of your supervisory committee, but these are words written by Professor Sicho. Okay. Dear Eric, I could simply say, Eric, this is the successful end of a long journey, but that would not do justice to the process. In my memory, it was more of an expedition than a journey. In 2016, we set out one enthusiastic research researcher followed by three careful observers. At various points along the way, we were not quite sure where we were going and where we would end up. However, Eric, you marched ahead, irrespective of obstacles and unperturbed by unknown territory, always. You were certain that the expedition was worth undertaking and in, in the end, it would make an important contribution to our understanding of how democracies can end. And it did do so. 
the world and truths are always explored by the bold and fearless. We always knew from history that democracies can die. We know from the works of Levitsky and Siblat, for example, but also from the research of others that even democratically elected leaders can use their power to undermine and in the end, even kill democracies. You showed us which subtle tools, i.e. which almost undetectable murder weapons can be used in an environment where open suppression would not be tolerated. You identified economic attacks on media and certain forms of harassment of journalists, nearly invisible too, and under the radar screen of the general public as the main subtle instruments to curb media freedom. Using these tools strategically are pivotal steps to accelerate the overall decay of democratic freedom. Once media freedom is curbed or no longer exists democratically, elected leaders can openly transit to illiberal leaders and from there to dictators without having to fear the backlash of public opinion. We know and we knew that this can happen. We just now even see it happen more often than we would like to. You, Eric, showed us how this process can be engineered. And equally important, you showed us how the clandestine process of curbing media freedom can be detected and to some extent even measured in a relatively objective way. This topic is now more relevant than it was for decades in many societies and regions, and sadly, much more so than it was when you started your PhD project. Being highly relevant for our understanding of political processes is by far the most important criteria for any research in a school of governance. And what can be more relevant for a school of governance, governance than understanding by what concrete means democracies can be undermined? The expedition was long and fraught with technical, logistical, time, and health challenges. We also had to overcome a number of incongruities between the conceptual backpacks of the different disciplines involved in the supervisory team and the doctoral candidate. Eric, you successfully dealt with all of them. And you did that always in a remarkably good spirit. What made the journey successful in the end was a number of things your love for your subject, your enthusiasm, your intellectual curiosity, your ability to think outside the box, your ability to work at any hour of the day or night, and your unwavering commitment to work for press freedom. You are the most committed, most determined and enthusiastic student Professor Sichon has ever had. You are also the only one who could, when asked one question, answer, for others that you consider more relevant as we witness today. Before you grace the original question with an answer. When we started, I was intrigued by the man from the Sunshine State with Cuban background, who had served on a presidential campaign, ran a company, did press freedom and communication projects in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and elsewhere for the World Bank, the USAID, and others spoke a number of languages, bears the first name of an East German dictator, and yet worked on media freedom. And on top, he claimed that there would still be enough hours in the day to also write a PhD thesis. And indeed, during the next five years, you never failed to surprise me, and your ideas always remained intriguing. Congratulations, Eric. Thank you for taking your supervisory team on this exciting expedition. And during that expedition, the mutual respect and friendship between the team grew and will remain. And that again is also no small achievement. Michael Sicho. So, dear Dr. De La Fuente, on behalf of the Board of Deans and the Rector, I uh, wholeheartedly congratulate you with this uh, achievement. Um, and before I close this uh, academic ceremony, I would like to um, indicate a little bit of the logistics. Uh, we will stay here because there's a photo moment with the people online. Um, 
So, and afterwards, uh, we will go uh, outside this uh, room. So, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to chair this uh, session. And again, congratulations. Uh, and hereby, I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>